Hey, this is Avi Gutman with another Ask Me Anything event brought to you by QuantReasoning.com. I invite you to join me live next time. We do this every Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern, and you can attend for free by starting your free trial at QuantReasoning.com. You actually want a ramp down period right before the test. It's a bit like athletics. Like if you're uh, preparing for a marathon run, you don't run a marathon the day before your marathon. You sit on a couch and eat pasta and carb up. And uh, it's the same with the GMAT. If you look at bodybuilders in the two weeks before their competition, they don't lift heavy. Same thing here. So you want to ramp down your studying right before your test. And uh, if you do need to ramp up at some point, then I would say do that well ahead of the test and uh, so give yourself two weeks right before the test to stop studying entirely. I'm a bit surprised because I actually find it a lot less taxing to solve using reasoning than using, say, algebra. And I wonder if that's just because I've been doing it for a while. So reasoning doesn't feel like that big of a challenge just in terms of the mental load that, that it requires, uh, but it used to. So it does get better with time and practice. But I've actually seen with a lot of students that when they do quant first and then verbal, their verbal improves when they switch from math to reasoning and quant which either indicates that they have more gas in the tank left over for verbal and or they're already in a reasoning kind of mindset from quant and that serves them well when they go into verbal because it's the same part of the brain that, uh, that they're using in both sections. Whereas if you uh, are using a lot of textbook math and algebra in the quant section, you go into the verbal section cold in terms of reasoning. You haven't actually done any reasoning yet, and, and so you're starting from scratch. So I think it's uh, some combination of those two uh, that lead to improvement in the verbal section when we switch from math to reasoning in the quant section. If you find it a lot more mentally taxing to use reasoning than to use autopilot math, then I would say just continue practicing reasoning until it's not that mentally taxing because it, it, it won't be once you've done enough of it. The biggest careless mistake I've seen students make in the math part comes from uh, carelessness in simplifying algebraic equations and inequalities that has to do with the language that their internal monologue is using. I'll give you an example. Imagine that you have an equation that says 3x minus 5 is equal to 2x plus 5. What I've seen students often do is they'll, uh, they'll say to themselves, well, I'm going to move the 2x over to the other side and I'm going to move the negative 5 over to the other side. You see how I'm using the language of, of moving? And I've, I've just made two mistakes, and, and then they would infer that x is 0. I've made two mistakes along the way because I used the word move. Instead of using the word move, I, I've even heard a student say float. I'm floating it to the other side. Instead of that, you need to articulate what it is that you're doing arithmetically to both sides of the equation. So I'm going to be adding 5 to both sides. And now I'm going to be subtracting 2x from both sides. And then you avoid that, uh, that kind of careless mistake. So articulating the arithmetic operation that you're going to be performing on both sides of the equation can make a big difference for, from what I've seen with students. Uh, and with inequalities, you're a lot more likely to catch yourself before you make a mistake. For example, if you have an inequality that says, 3 over x is less than 7 over x. If you articulate, well, I'm going to multiply both sides of this inequality by x, 
you're much more likely to catch yourself and say, wait, I don't know whether X is positive or negative, and that matters, because if it's negative, I'd have to flip the sign. But if you don't articulate it to yourself in your internal monologue, then you're much more likely to, uh, to miss that and to just uh, go ahead and multiply both sides by X. Uh, similarly, you know, if an equation says this, a lot of people would just say, oh, that means X is 1. And that's not wrong, but it's also not complete. There's another option. But if you're articulated, well, I'm going to be dividing both sides of this equation by x, you're much more likely to catch yourself and say, wait, what if x is 0? You're not allowed to divide by 0. Right? Or maybe instead you'd say, I'm going to subtract x from both sides. That's another option. So I'm subtracting x from both sides, then take x out as a common factor, and then you see that x is either 0 or x minus 1 is 0, which would mean that x is 1. Right? Or alternatively, if you wanted to divide both sides by x, you'd say, well, if x is 0, then I can't do that, so that's one option. And if x is not 0, then I can divide both sides by x, and I get x equals 1. But when you don't articulate to yourself what it is exactly arithmetically that you want to perform on the equation or the inequality, then that leads to a lot of careless mistakes. I mean, the other kind of mistake that I've made a million times with word problems is missing the word different. I probably talked about this in a previous AMA, uh, but you know when they when they say there's a set of six different positive integers and you miss the word different, you're almost definitely going to make a mistake on that question. So uh, what I like to do is, if they if they're talking about a set a set of six numbers, if it says that they're different, I'll do something like this. So I'm preparing my spaces for the six numbers with inequality signs among them. So they're going to be in ascending order from left to right. And in the absence of the word different, I would make these less than or equal. Now, this forces me to look really closely at the question and look for the word different. Is the word different present or is the word different absent? And that's good. I want something, I want some kind of approach that forces me to investigate really closely for the presence or absence of the word different, because I've made that mistake so many times in the GMAT. When you start reading a question, and it actually doesn't matter whether it's data sufficiency or problem solving, you want to be reading extremely slowly, with a lot of pauses and uh, just giving yourself time to digest everything that you're reading. Uh, you gave an example of a question that mentions that x is a positive integer. So maybe it's a good idea to jot down on your paper x equals 1, 2, 3, dot, dot, dot. Or if they said x is a positive even integer, you'd jot down something like this. I don't know that I'm ever going to refer back to that note. I just made the note because it helped me digest the words that I just read. Because it's one thing to read x is a positive even integer which you might read way too fast and move on and forget you ever saw it, especially under pressure. It's another thing to take a few seconds to write down on your paper x equals 2, 4, 6, etc. Uh, it just helps you digest the information and makes it less likely that you'll forget it. If we're not given an integer constraint, I really like to use number lines because a number line is visually very continuous. It just, you kind of see that on the number line there's an infinite number of, of places to, to place whatever the, the variable is. Uh, and then the, the last tip is I would say when you have chosen your answer, before you click confirm, give the question one more quick read at the very end to make sure you didn't miss anything like, oh, it's an integer, or no, they didn't tell me that it's an integer, or anything like that. What I would not do is I would not write down in my paper, x is a positive even integer because I don't feel that that helps me digest the words. I'm just copying words down from the screen. I don't think that there's a lot of value add there. I think there's a lot more value add in uh, what I have here on the left. I think that if you're, w when you're practicing at home, if you attempt to solve every question you see 
using as many approaches as you can think of, then over time you're going to develop a really strong intuition that will help you quickly determine which approach will be most effective for a new question that you've never seen before. Because any new question that you get on your on test day, it won't be 100% new. It will look something like some other question that you've seen during your practice. And if you used five different approaches to solve that question during your practice, well, now you'll, you'll just know which approach to use at the test center because you have that kind of experience. So I think that's the answer to your question, is to just make sure that you're using every single approach you can think of when you're solving questions at home, and that's where the intuition will come from on test day of which approach to use when. Our goal at home is not to solve the question correctly. That's actually the worst thing that can happen at home. Right? Get, looking at a question and then solving it correctly is the worst because why would that move your GMAT score up? If you think about that, it was a complete waste of time to do a question that you got right. Your GMAT score will remain the same. And it's interesting because at the test center, we have the exact opposite goal. At the test center, my goal is to pick the right answer as quickly as possible and move on to the next one. At home, that's a disaster. We don't want to do that. If we do that, our score will never improve. My goal in reviewing the question is to learn something from it. So I try to identify what is the concept that the GMAT is trying to test in this question. Like they wrote this question for a reason. And that reason is unlikely to be testing my middle school math knowledge. It's unlikely that that's the reason they wrote the question because Business schools aren't really interested uh, in that, or to the extent that they are interested, they just look at my GPA from university or maybe also from high school. I think I had to submit my high school GPA as well when I, when I applied to business school. So they already have access to you know figuring out how good I was at middle school math. They don't need the GMAT for that. So, and by the way, same goes in the verbal section. Every question that you see there's a reason why it was created. They're testing something, some concept that has to do with reasoning because it's all, it's, you know, it's either verbal reasoning, quantitative reasoning, or integrated reasoning. What do they all have in common? Reasoning. That's what they're, that's what all the questions are designed to test. That really needs to drive our review of the question after the fact. What concept, what conceptual understanding, what abstraction are they interested in testing in this question? And what did I learn from having tried this question? And if I got it right, there's maybe not as much for me to learn from it. So I'm actually hoping to not get it right. Like I, I learn a lot more from questions that I got wrong. So I'm actually disappointed at home when I find out that I got a question right. And I, I think that's a really important mindset to have when you're practicing at home. Because I think most people celebrate when they get a question right at home and they give themselves a high five. No, you don't want to get the questions right. If you found this video useful, go to quantreasoning.com for a lot more where that came from. You should also click that like button and let me know in the comments below what you'd like me to make future videos about. And of course, if you haven't yet subscribed, go ahead and do that and click that bell below so you get notified about future videos. See you next time.